full sugar Uso Penitentiary. Bam! Welcome to another edition of the Schmozcast. I'm your host, Anthony, along with Chandler and Andre in the studio at 103.5 The Sun, WLSPLP Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. How are we doing, fellas? Doing excellent. I would just like to start today off by saying happy birthday to you, uh, uh, Anthony. I almost called you Andre. Happy birthday, Anthony. Why, thank you. We've all had a, a cluster of birthdays. Yes. All of a sudden, we're all older. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Happy birthday to you. Why, th- you. why, thank you, sir. And happy birthday to you, Andre. Oh, thank you. Hell yeah. Big week in wrestling, as it seems to always be, especially these last few weeks, has been seemingly more important when you thought that uh, with the holidays that things wouldn't get as crazy as they have. But you, we had, in addition to WWE, of course, Wrestle Kingdom 12. And I know I'm not going to give away spoilers. I'm just going to say that everyone should watch it if they get a chance. Amazing matches. Everything that I saw was awesome. I've seen three of the matches. And I think that uh, that the hype was lived up to, and there's a lot more to look forward to. And New Japan has continued to, to take another step in the direction towards being competition some point in the near future, I think, for, uh, for WWE, which will be the first time really. I'm not sure really. When, when, was, when do you think TNA was at its hottest and it had the best chance to be considered competition? Or was there a time that you guys considered a competition? Or a time that you were watching TNA more than WWE. Oh, there was absolutely a point in time when I was watching TNA more than WWE. And it was when um, they still had the six-sided ring. They would they would come up the, the, the ramp, like, led up. And there was, like, a little camera angle that they would show the, the wrestler, like, walking up the ramp. And then they would be on the stage. And then they'd walk down to the ring. Uh, the ropes were still red. It was, I mean, it was, it was when guys like AJ Styles, Samoa Joe... Uh, you had Team Canada, which Bobby Roode was a part of. Eric Young was also a part of it. I mean, I'm going to be naming a lot of names that they, are in the WWE currently. They were loaded for a, there were a couple stints there, especially looking back on it now and, and like the wealth of talent. And that was like, and that was during the time that WWE was kind of in a weird, obscure place, kind of post Attitude Era, pre where we're at with the the PG era now, and they didn't quite have the talent that they do they still had big names like you know john cena and john cena and randy orton and guys like undertaker and Shawn michaels were still around during that time but especially when as far as like young up-and-coming talent goes they really didn't have much of it then but tna was absolutely stacked with it at that point in time i want to say that was around oh oh six to oh nine or ten so around the time that kurt angle came into the fold for tna it kind of yes. s- was more of a solidification, or yes. you know, to the roster, and I, I don't know. I feel, feel like that brought a lot of things together. And this was before, too, before WWE had 
a real developmental system. I mean, I think they did have they had FCW, FCW at the time, but it wasn't stuff like that. But it wasn't televised the way NXT is. Pretty much the only way that you could watch FCW is if you lived down in Florida, and and I mean, yeah, like all the all the. And, all the people that came up through NXT once FCW became NXT, they were there. But like I said, it was a lot harder back then to try to catch FCW than it is to watch NXT now. And the thing about FCW and Ohio Valley and places like that compared to NXT today is they were kind of run more like an indie promotion in and of itself. Whereas NXT, yes, it's run like an indie promotion, but their ramp is this. I mean, if I don't know if you've seen the documentary. Yeah. Triple H talks about the ramp is the same. It's smaller, but it's the same angle, angle, the same camera angles, the same hard camera, everything like that. So you're preparing for being on the main roster, whereas OVW and FCW, I don't think that that was exactly the case. I don't know, because like you said, it was hard to catch that. Yeah, it's rare that you get to see too much of that. That's one thing I'd like to be added to the network eventually is more Ohio Valley, more more Florida. I mean, there is there is some things. Uh, I know there, are especially that era with Lesnar, Cena, Batista, Orton, I, and I feel like it's Benjamin. only it's only going to be a matter of time because they've they've put all of NXT on the network recently, like since it became NXT, since it switched from FCW right. to NXT. They have like pretty much all of NXT on there now so it's only a matter of time before they they start going through that back stuff and then you get the FCW and Ohio Valley stuff which I would love to see on there as well yeah and it's uh, just one of those things that when when the network first came out that it was they would count the NXT episodes from there on or they they're counted from where NXT started but they only put on from you know that February of 2014 so, but back to the TNA thing. So, really loaded roster, and that was the time that TNA would have been at its best. And looking back now, especially where everyone has kind of bloomed into and and where their careers have gone, could you say that TNA squandered a lot of this talent, or did they, or did they, you know, make hay while the sun is out? They squandered it because they had all those guys: Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, Eric Young. I'm trying not to leave anybody out. Practically half the WWE roster. I mean, now. even our truth. He was our truth yep. was an NWA world champ, two time NWA world champion in Voodoo TNA Ken Mafia. Yeah. And and yes. yeah, and their problem is they brought in guys like Hogan and Bischoff, and then they brought in guys like Flair and Foley. And those guys are, I love those guys. Don't get me wrong, but they put all those guys at the top, and they held down the guys like Styles and Bobby Roode and those guys. And they kind of did what WCW did, where they kept the old guys like Hogan on top, because Hogan was involved in that and everything. And that kind of squandered. Can you guys imagine if they would have kept that core that they had and maybe brought in other guys that WWE, if they would have got bigger and brought in guys that WWE didn't have on their radar at first, like Kevin Owens or people like that. Can you imagine the competition they'd be for them now the with the AJ be Styles and a Bobby Roode? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh. it'd be... Incredible. So they definitely squandered it. I and think. yeah, I 100 percent agree with you around the time that they were bringing in the, the Bischoffs and the Hogan's and, you know, kind of the old Russo too. the the Russo, the old guard of pro wrestling. That's when I stopped paying attention, because just like Andre said, it felt like WCW again. And if and you could you could see that you could see the direction it was going in and you could see that it was about to get ran straight into the ground, just like WCW was. And unfortunately, that happened. So uh, that was around the time. I, I mean, I still would watch, but I wasn't watching nearly as much as before all of those those names that we said uh, before they kind of got bought brought into the the fold. Like I, it just the product changed. It went from it went from this exciting new thing that I had I had no idea who any of these wrestlers were, and they were all amazingly talented. To me, then watching people that I used to watch ten. 15 years prior and that doing, were old doing, then that were old then <laughs> 10 15 years later they're back on tv and doing the exact same angles that they were doing back then and it's just like i don't want to watch this again i would rather watch these new these new guys that i had no idea who they were i would rather watch them put on the fantastic matches that they would but instead you know we got what we got uh before i make this other point i do want to point another name that i feel bad that i missed out when i was talking about the young guys back then is jay lethal's another one yep. but what i was going to say is uh <laughs> best uh, promo ever was rick flair to rick oh flair I, that's they my... did it twice and both <laughs> oh, of them were man. both promos were gold oh man but we might have to maybe we'll have to play that at the end I of the show i wouldn't mind that but what i a point i wanted to make is i find it ironic and sad that tna brought in 
all the old, as you said, all the old guard of WCW that came in and they went and made the exact same mistakes that they made at WCW. I would expect guys like that to be smarter and to to learn from their mistakes. But I don't know if like ego or what got in the way, but they came into to TNA and made the exact same mistakes that they did in WCW and it almost brought them to the ground and they're only alive now because of one broken Matt Hardy and the people involved with that. But yeah, that's, that's sad because they could have been competition and then WWE would have been better because they would have forced been forced to step out of their comfort zone and take some risks. And Bruce Pritchard has said it many times that the what WWE was always or WWF at the time was always at its best when they had someone breathing down their neck or they or they were, you know, relegated to number two on of the of the wrestling world. So that I mean, competition can be a huge thing. So is TNA's story ultimately going to be WCW 2.0, where anyone who had uh, WWE dust on them, if you will, sprinkle, you know, that they, they would it's just the name that they had them so they want to put them on you know or or 20 years ago they were popular so is that the one of the biggest like faults of of TNA and are they just the newest portion of WCW but in, to a much lesser extent unfortunately that's exactly how i feel and <clears throat> excuse me that's how i felt ever since you know those older guys that we mentioned came in I said it. I said it earlier. You could see. You could. You could see it happen. You could see. You could watch TV week week to week and see the change happen and see it go from the TNA that it was to, as you said, WCW 2.0. Part of the reason why the Bullet Club is so popular today, and the Young Bucks are so popular, and New Japan Pro Wrestling is so popular, is because they're different than WWE. And TNA was like that at one point, too, when they had Styles and Rude and all those guys. But then they kind of became WWE light. And when they did that, that was kind of their demise because it's like they they made the same mistakes WCW did. And then they try to be WWE light and it just doesn't. You got to be different. You got to be different. The Young Bucks and all them, the Bullet Club, all those guys, they're different. And that's part of the reason why they're so exciting, in my opinion. And some of the things when WWE was transitioning out of the attitude era tna was still doing things that you that were you could tie into the attitude era or things that would have worked then or not not like rehashing it but expanding upon and doing an updated version in some or in some ways yeah and so that was another thing that drew us who were kids attitude era fans got older and it made more sense to almost follow tna in the mid to late 2000s and then pulling in names that for me, like Voodoo Kin Mafia, I'm a big, I'm Road Dog was always my favorite wrestler. So that is another thing that would get me involved. Not necessarily great angles or, you know, but still fun promos. And it's the people, it's the wrestlers that you love to watch. But then it got too old with the the super dinosaurs in there. And yeah, it just w- was too much. But and not that there's not a spot for those older guys. It's just that they were put on the top and they stayed on the top. And that was the problem. As opposed to, and not putting over young guys necessarily. Yep. yep. As much as I love him and as big of a fan as I am of his, and even his, in, in my opinion, his run was his run in, in TNA was some of the best stuff in his career. Sting did not need to be on the top of that company for as much as as much as he was at that point in time. He held the TNA slash NWA World Title, what like three or four times I want to say during his time in in um, in TNA and. You had guys, you know, you had all these different guys. Granted, he, he he could still go at that time, and he was still putting on great matches, but he didn't need to be the champion at that time. He could you could have put the you, you could have put the belt on Jay Lethal instead of having him only be an X Division champion and then leave the company for Ring of Honor and you know go to Greener Pastures. You could have put it. Bobby Roode did end up getting a, a great heel title run, but he could have had more than just that one title run. Um, you know, there's there's it's just. It's just going back to we're just, I'm just you know echoing and reiterating everything that we've already said that at that time they did not need to go with the the older veterans and as Andre said there definitely is a spot for those people on a show for sure like there will always be a spot for those guys on any show but they didn't need to be in the main event they didn't need to be the focus they didn't need to be the champions at that time and they were Shawn Michaels retired in 2010 his last world title reign was in 2003 that that to me is what sting should have been doing in 
TNA. And he was still having world title matches. Oh, yeah. He just yep. wasn't winning them, and yep. that's completely fine. Yep. He yeah, and his win loss record, he had more more losses than wins in that span time in that period of time, but he still put on classic matches. And whether he won or lost, his opponent almost always was, you know, better after coming out of that. So not to say that Sting didn't I love Sting, so not to say that he didn't, and that's not his fault. If you're at that point in your career and they say, Hey, we're gonna put the title on you, you're not gonna I'm not gonna him. say no. Hell no. Oh, heck no, no, exactly. So I, I don't I don't put it on him. I just yeah, I agree with that. That's that's too bad. What could have been? I just like I said earlier, I think about what could have been with all those guys if they kept that core of young talent together and put them in the put them at the top and had them feud with oh my gosh it's everything we're seeing now except when they were younger and more athletic (laughs) it's just i'm glad to see that the handful of names that we mentioned that were like some of the tna originals are in wwe now and they're getting the recognition that they deserve aj styles two-time world champion eric young former uh nxt tag champ Bobby Roode, former NXT champ, Samoa Joe, former NXT champ, and you know they're both on the main roster now. So it's it's cool to see that they're they are getting their due, but it definitely should have been then. So you talk about Sting's titles, and was one of them? Did he win the title one time from Jeff Hardy, where he maybe wasn't supposed to, but Jeff Hardy was Jeff Hardy so was messed a train up. Wreck, yeah. So I, so oh. I'll lessen one out, like one of those I'll put as okay, but yeah, you don't want. You know, you want uh, your top performers who are in their prime to me to be the champions. You know, it didn't. I never was a big fan of when Hogan got the title in '02 or Flair. I mean, at the, t- the there was a brand split, so it was, a, it was a little bit different where they weren't necessarily the top guy that you're running with. But um, I don't know. I'm, I was never a big fan of that. Yeah, no, same. I agree. I agree, especially the H- Hogan back in the day. That that one gets it. Just <laughs> I know he's Hogan, but at that stage in his career. He's very beatable. I'm sorry. Yeah, and it, if they wanted to tell me, hey, it was so we could feed him to Lesnar, and that's kind of, that is sort of what happened. Then I, you know, I, I suppose. But yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So at one point, TNA was competition for WWE. You would have said around that time that we mentioned there, uh, when once Kurt Angle came over in 0506 for the next three or four years, that TNA was behind the scenes a mess but there was a lot of good stuff going on in the ring and you can look at a ton of those matches so you would have put wwe then tna and you know whatever wherever the chips would have fallen i guess for the next few slots there now i think that tna goes down to number four or five depending what do you guys think i'm going wwe in terms of how big and important they are right it's wwe then i think it's new japan and then i would say ring of honor who still does a lot of cross promotional stuff or you know you'll see ring of honor guys and new japan new japan guys in ring of honor then lucha underground i I, I imagine you're gonna put that ahead of tna right now where where do you guys stand on that that the the list that you just that that you just said i agree 100 percent with wwe one new japan two um ring of honor three and uh lucha four and then and then TNA. Yeah, after and then that. you're a WCW, WCPW guy, which Defiant. is now called Defiant. Mm-hmm. So you're going to pop them in there ahead of TNA, I would guess. I personally would because, I mean, you got Austin Aries as their world champion right now, and he signed a six month contract with them. He's not going to TNA. You know what I mean? Uh, so I put them above them because I, I like them. But yeah, I'd say there are under other indies that I don't really watch much of that I would probably think are more just based on. You don't see a lot of the big stars that aren't in WWE clamoring to go to TNA. They all want to do Ring of Honor or New Japan or other places, you know. That's a good point. Uh, Marty Skrull and Austin Aries just had a month ago a Defiant World title match. That was really good where Austin Aries won. And, I mean, those two, are, they're not they're not facing each other in TNA. They're, they're in other places. They're in Ring of Honor. They're in, you know, I think Austin Aries is not only uh, Defiant, but I think there's another – indie promotion that he's uh, a part of as well at the moment uh i don't i don't i don't know enough about it but it's like yeah you don't see those guys wanting to go to tna right now uh, another blunder for tna that we haven't mentioned was making uh kazuchika i hope i'm saying that correctly okada <laughs> i'm doing i always try and do it really fast there in the middle kazuchika i think that's how Kaz- you say kazuchika it? okada uh they had him but they gave him a kato gimmick and he's wait who's who's kato could you explain that kato is Kato is like the Green Hornet's little buddy, if I'm not right. This yes, is, I'm, yes. I, I did a Google pick up here too, mm-hmm. and they also have the Seth Rogen film. But it, it's, I think it was a remake of a TV show back in the Green Hornet. It, it yes, was a the, yeah, it was a comic. 
Oh, okay, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. All right. For some reason, I thought maybe I'm, now I'm thinking of a car. I don't know what's going on. No, there is a car. They have a they have a souped up car that shoots rockets and okay. that type of stuff. Okay. <laughs> but yes, hell yes. But yeah, so they had him. They had him, and he's arguably one of the you. He could be the best wrestler in the world right now. I think for me, he's certainly top three to five, and I think a lot. He'd be in a lot of people's top ten right now, and it's, he's another guy that they kind of. They put a bad gimmick on, and now he's the guy somewhere else. And he's been the guy for two-plus years. But, I mean, you can't I, – I, I don't completely fault TNA for that because how many times has, had, has that happened in WWE? That's just – that's that's Very unfortunately, true. that's Very just true. a thing. I mean, look at Cody Rhodes. Yes. He was stardust for the last two and a half years of his career, and he left and, and pretty much instantly became champion everywhere, every promotion that he wrestled for. So I don't really – I don't fault – TNA too much for that. That I've, unfortunately, I think that's something that just happens, especially with these bigger promotions that especially are televised. Especially with foreign wrestlers that who too, they you know they, tend they to can slap, take advantage of. Yeah, and they tend to slap bad gimmicks on them, and it's hard for them to break out of that. And it took Okada to have to go back to Japan, but look at him now. Look you him you now. think he'd change anything? I, I don't think so. No. I think he's probably looks at it's that can build you, you know, in a lot of ways. Timing is everything sometimes in professional wrestling, and the timing wasn't right for Okada in TNA. The timing is right for him now, and I think everything worked out for the best for him. But, yeah, I don't fault TNA for that too much. Uh, yeah. So we, a ton of the guys we mentioned were Ring of Honor guys before they were TNA, WWE, New Japan. And and so do you guys view – do you guys think if you're WWE or maybe even New Japan, do you at some – did you at some point, maybe less so now, view Ring of Honor as – the best way to build a, a prospect, if you will, uh, compared to an FCW or Ohio Valley, especially at that time, what Ring of some of the guys that were pumped out by Ring of Honor, do you think that WWE viewed them as, uh, you know, more of a an indie promotion, but also somewhat of a building block, almost like a, the minor leagues? I don't mean that in a in a bad way towards Ring of Honor, but you get what I'm saying. Like yeah, that was their less than their WWE. system to their. Uh, Gosh, I can't think of the word, but you guys get what I'm saying to enhance your products. I did not realize until around the time of CM Punk and Daniel Bryan really coming on. I didn't realize how much talent goes through Ring of Honor and then from there becomes, you know, a big time world star on a bigger stage such as New Japan, TNA or WWE. I absolutely feel that way. And w- once I did find out like all of these names that had gone through Ring of Honor, I kind of I thought to myself, Ring of Honor is almost like WWE's developmental. It's, Thank it's, you. It's, That's what I'm trying to say. Developmental weird. system. Because they have their own developmental system. They had Ohio Valley Wrestling and then FCW. And still to this day, TNA is, or I'm sorry, uh, NXT, even though it's become its own brand, its own show, it's still... At, it's at its core it's still developmental it's still there to get people ready to go on tv on either raw or smackdown but all of that being said you could argue that t or that ring of honor really was especially at that time really really was wwe's developmental because so much of their talent started there and whether or not they went somewhere else after that or came straight to the wwe they they all started in Ring of not all but you know mo, uh, a lot of the big the big name and the big independent names started in Ring of Honor. The list is seemingly endless. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially like Daniel Bryan, CM Punk, Small Joe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Ring of Honor was perfect for that because it wasn't. They didn't have a big TV deal, so guys could hone their craft, and then WWE could be like, okay, this guy's kind of rising up about out of here. So yeah, I guess they'd look at them as a developmental, but I don't think it was. I don't. I guess I don't want to use the word raid, but WWE is the the big dog on in town, and when they see talent out of the smaller promotions, they're gonna try and snatch them up. And I can't say I blame them for that because you want the best wrestlers in the world on your your roster. So yeah, I guess you know a developmental territory. They kind of use it as that. I don't think that they looked at it that way per se. And I don't think Ring of Honor wanted to necessarily think that. But mm-hmm. you get some of your guys over. They're your top guys and then eventually go on to do good things in WWE. That says a lot. That reflects very well back on yeah. Ring of Honor. Oh, absolutely. And it's good for Ring of Honor because their past is kind of a little dodgy with some very serious legal issues their former with their former owner and stuff. So I'm really happy to see where they have come from that. It's really a cool story and a cool situation and some of the 
my favorite wrestlers of all time have come from there. CM Punk, Daniel Bryan being the two that come to my mind right away. Daniel Bryan's stuff in Ring of Honor. And granted, I've only watched probably less than 10 of his matches, probably between 7 to 10 of his matches in Ring of Honor. And they were all incredible. Some of the best technical wrestling you could ever mm-hmm. watch. Yep. Daniel Bryan and Ring yep. of Honor. So, yeah, Ring of Honor. I'm really happy for them. I'm really gl- I don't watch much of them right now, but I'm really happy to see where they're at. And I'm really happy to see them on... Is it Fox that mm-hmm. they're on national TV? That's I think that's, that's really great. Cool. Mm-hmm. And doing I, th- I think Saturday night Saturday night is a really great spot. I, I think it is a good spot for them. Um, you brought up NXT. I if they were if you consider them separate from WWE, I mean at some point at some point before the brand split, we wouldn't really watch SmackDown. It was kind of especially before it was live and everything. There was almost no reason to, so you would change things around. But now I it was will all part two for so long. Yeah, and now but sm- now being separate, SmackDown. You know, suppose you were to separate the WWE, the NXT, Raw, and Spec- like I would put all those above T above TNA right now, and oh, yeah. and NXT, even even like two hundred five live, I would watch over TNA right now, and cruiser like the cruiserweight division, that's uh, more of it is because of some of the storylines and it's fun and fun matches, but even that it's hard to be consistent with watching whatsoever. I fall off very easily, but Ring of Honor is right up there. I, I think they. They they are they still put on some of the best stuff and some of their guys are it's still the same thing but they're so much closer to being considered more of a, a top level promotion so they've done a great job but for TNA what are some names that would change your mind what are what are what would get you to view TNA next week is there a certain <laughs> oh, next I mean, week never mind <laughs> well why, why do you say that Daniel Bryan is the name I was gonna say okay so next September <laughs> yeah you Daniel Bryan is on TNA. My TV's coming out. Oh, one hundred percent. I'm right there with you. And I think Omega, Okada, CM Punk. Yep. I think those are the four big ones. Do you? Can you think of other people that? For me personally, oh yeah, Marcus sure. Girl. I mean, he's one of my Jesus favorites. Christ. I know you don't no, like I'm him, just kidding. and I give you, I give you crap for that. But I love Marcus Girl. So if he was on TNA, I'd turn that on in an instant too. Chandler, is there other people that would immediately? draw your attention and not some of the your standard WWE pillars like a Randy Orton or a John Cena but something more maybe viable that could potentially happen Penta, I, Penta L0M formerly known as Pentagon Dark formerly known as Pentagon Jr. If he Jesus. if he him and his brother Phoenix if either of them I would imagine they would go together but if either of them were to join up with with TNA Impact whatever you want to call it I would have to watch especially Pentagon he's He's one of my favorite wrestlers in the world right now, and everything about him. I've never, I've never watched someone cut a promo in another language, with or without subtitles, and felt, felt it as much as when he cuts his promos in Spanish. It's it's fantastic, and I'm just I'm I'm such a huge fan of his that if if he were to be a part of TNA, I would absolutely tune in. There's another name, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how he performed at Wrestle Kingdom. If Chris Jericho decided to, for some bizarre reason, take his talents to TNA, I would turn it on for that, too. Because Jericho is, Jericho is incredible, and I think when all is said and done, he's going to be one of the top five greatest wrestlers of all time. There you go. A future um, Mount Rushmore of wrestling, potentially, for Jericho. So WWE has now signed a couple guys from Ring of Honor, or people that guys that spent a lot of time there, such as Ricochet, Prince Puma, of course, in Lucha Underground, War Machine, and Rockstar Spud, who is more of the one of the more recent TNA guys. Where do you guys? What do you guys? We've had this conversation in a in a text group. What do you guys think about where they'll go, what they'll do with them, whether it be changing the names, keep putting a mask on Ricochet? I, I to me, you go. I, or, I don't know. Let's, let's, I want to hear your guys's. I personally, okay. Ricochet, I don't want to see this happen because I don't want him to get pigeonholed. But I, I feel like they're going to put him on 205 Live. His talents are, and I, I don't like saying this because I feel like it's making a slight at the cruiserweight division, but his talents are so much more than that. Although, although he would fit in right, right, you know, fit in perfectly with the cruiserweights, and that's fine. But I think he could do so much more than that. I would love to see War Machine on Monday Night Raw because Monday Night Raw uh, virtually has doesn't have a tag division compared to SmackDown Live and what they've been doing with their tag teams lately. And I don't know, they're bigger guys, so I just feel like they would fit in on Monday Night Raw better than they would SmackDown. 
and I'm pretty sure it's already been announced that Spud, Rockstar Spud, is going to be in the cruiserweight division, which that I'm okay with. But yeah, th- uh, that being said, I feel like Ricochet, Ricochet and War Machine are most likely going to start off in, in NXT, spend about a year or so there, the way that they usually do with big name indie indie signings, and go from there. But if I had if I had an ideal choice, I would put Ricochet on. I'd put him on SmackDown just to keep him away from the Cruiserweight division. And then I'd put War Machine on Raw, and I'd put Rockstar Spud in the Cruiserweight division. Okay, no NXT in, at all for any of them? No, I don't think they need it. Okay. I don't think any of them need it. They've, they've, been, they've all been wrestling long enough. They've all, been, they've all worked TV lo- long enough. I know that they haven't worked WWE style, and that would, they, they, they would benefit from going down to NXT and learning w, WWE style of of in-ring performance and how to work TV, but I don't think it's necessary for them, any of them. I, I'm i worried that they're going to put Ricochet on 205 Live, and it's weird to say that. If they, the talent on 205 Live is really good. I don't, yeah. Yeah. they need a little more freedom to be cruiserweights, I, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I think they're going to put him there. I don't want to see that. I, I don't want to see him change his name either. I think he is well known enough that ricochet should be his name uh same with war machine i think they should keep them that name <sighs> i'd like to see war machine like short term in a group of some kind it sounds i don't want to say this because the way they look but i see them being with the wyatts maybe or with bray for a little bit i don't know if that would work or i see them like with, a new wyatt family not as i guess i mean i don't know i feel like bray needs Bray's a cult leader without a cult. It makes no sense if that's your gimmick is that you get people to follow you. And you don't. He doesn't have any followers. <laughs> uh, hello. Give him some followers, you know. But I'd like to see that, or I'd like to see them on Raw. And like you said, I'd like to see Ricochet on SmackDown. I'd like to see him at the mid-card level to start and then work his way up because he's got the talent to do that. Ricochet is so good. He's... He's one of the best in the world. When we were doing, I don't know if I ever said my list, but when we were doing our list of non-WWE matches, there were two names that popped up on my non-WWE top 10 match of the year more than anybody else, and that was Will Ospreay and Ricochet. And he's one of my favorites. He's incredibly talented. I think he should... I'm just worried. I don't want them to ruin him, but we'll see what happens. I think he's perfect SmackDown, and then Rockstar Spud 205 Live is a good spot for him. Okay, I want you guys to erase 205 Live from your mind. Don't you mean delete? Delete from from the day after WrestleMania to now. Okay, I want now we're going to go back a year, and you're putting Ricoch- Ricochet in 205 Live. How much different is that, right? Well, if you've got Neville and Austin Aries and more, maybe more excitement about the two of the 205 cru- Cruiserweight division. There's more, there's more excitement, especially coming out of the tournament where you also had guys like Abushi and Zack Saber Jr. Do you think a little bit, would it have made more sense to do it then when 205 Live had more of like this uh, positive aura? Absolutely. If if 205 Live today was the 205 Live then with all those names that you just mentioned, absolutely throw Ricochet into the mix there. And you're going to have some really good rivalries, some really good matches. Uh, and I think 205 Live could have, you know, snuck up and possibly – Taken, taken, you know, maybe, maybe bumped up past how much I like NXT with with those names and the the ability that the the matches that they could have had, but unfortunately, people left. Uh, you know, they went different directions, this, that, and the other. But as of right now, two hundred five live today, I would not want Ricochet to be put on that show. In the words of Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, yep. Okay, there you go. So. That says a lot, though, right? Because there, there's now it, it's it's a bad connotation with putting a, somebody in 205 Live. Whereas a year ago, they were I was watching 205 more than NXT, and there was a lot of people that I loved in NXT at that time. But if I only had that one extra hour, I was gonna watch 205 Live over over NXT at that time. But really, since WrestleMania, they've they just they kind of dropped the ball. I, I just it's just not where it was at. We talked about TNA squandering some opportunity. WWE squandered opportunity with 205 Live in the beginning. And now they've dropped three of their four, or I'm sorry, three of their five live shows that they were going to have. have they dropped been, three already? Three of the five. Um, and it's the first three, if it, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and 
they're also doing the Bray Wyatt, Matt Hardy, kind of the main event to get a bigger draw, which is, I think, a great idea, too. So that way, when they do actually have a match, they have done it in front of a crowd before. Uh, but that's a that's a good way to draw people in, I think. But it's yeah, it just doesn't look good for the cruiserweight division. So I hope that this road to WrestleMania will reinvigorate some things for them. But it's not looking great right now. That's kind of why I think they're going to put Ricochet on 205 Live because he's a big name that the hardcore fans know. So you put him on 205 Live, they're maybe hoping that we'll tune into that. This is what I see for him. It's He's going to go down the same path that a lot of guys have since NXT has been on the WWE Network. And that is a guy comes in, he does his first match at a pay-per-view, usually probably the first match, goes over, and then a couple within you know the next NXT takeover they work a main event or two maybe for like a season you know uh, and then and then he's on the main roster so i hope that he goes if he goes that path over the 205 live but also put ricochet on 205 live guess what i'm i'm gonna yeah, watch, watch. Yeah, me too. so that's uh, so, <laughs> so, it'll it can, work. so it will work but at the same but it's it's not the spot that we'd like to see him shining but he could could he single-handedly turn that ship around i think he could he definitely has a talent and he's so exciting to watch I think that it's 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 funny because when I went to SmackDown uh, a couple months ago in Milwaukee, I really honestly I, I I expected there there were some people that left after SmackDown and didn't stay for 205, but I think that if you put someone like Ricochet on 205 and you know you you're you're hyping up throughout throughout the episode of SmackDown, there you're hyping up you know be sure to stay after SmackDown 205 Live. We have Ricochet versus you know so and so. I think that that would keep people planted in their seats more. A name like a name like him. We could at some point in the near future have Ricochet versus Hideo Itami as a match. Um, can Ricochet turn the division around? Yes, comma, and I'm not talking about the Godfather with the right booking, because Ricochet being on 205 Live, I'm going to tune in. You're going to tune in. The question is, can they keep us tuned in? If they book him to where I don't like the way that he's portrayed on TV, I don't know if I'm going to watch, you know. So, yes, he can with the right booking, but I'm confident. I'm really confident. There are certain guys that even we give WWE some slack for not booking characters the way we want them to. There are certain certain wrestlers that are just good enough that you know that they're going to be able to overcome poor booking if it happens. I look at Kevin Owens as an example. I look at Daniel Bryan as an example. Even AJ Styles in a sense. But he was never booked too poorly in my opinion. But Ricochet is someone that I think can outshine that because of what he does in the ring. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. I hope he doesn't go to 205 Live, but when he does, I'm watching for at least the beginning. Let's see if they can keep me keep me tuned in. And I don't want to say that it's all negative on 205 Live since WrestleMania. Any promotion, any federation loses their top two guys, It's things are going to suffer. Business is going to go down. It's not going to be as entertaining. And maybe, though, it's maybe they should have been more prepared for it. But when you lose Neville and Aries, it's not like... It's a huge loss. It's, it's a big deal. It really is. So I don't want to make it seem that it, they've, it was all WWE's fault. I mean, they're part of the reason that they lost those guys. And you hope they can pick up the pieces leading into Mania for this year and kind of get things back to where it was. And all that excitement with the Cruiserweight Classic and then leading into 205 Live was spectacular. And those first few months were awesome. Part of the reason why I haven't tuned in much to 205 Live is, yes, the booking in uh, is a small fraction of it. But the main reason, and it's kind of changed in recent weeks slash months, but they didn't have the same freedom in ring as the Cruiserweight Classic. Some of the matches in the Cruiserweight Classic were just... I don't i don't want to bash the current 205 Live guys, but the matches in the Cruiserweight Classic were so good, and I don't understand why they can't have that same kind of freedom to do more in the ring. I guess I understand WWE has a certain style, but you get that style on Raw, you get that style on SmackDown, let... The Cruiserweights be something different. I agree 100% with that. Watching the Cruiserweight Classic last summer, it was that was some of the most exciting wrestling that I can remember watching recently. And the style of wrestling that they were doing, it was, it was more of the independent style where pretty much all of the competitors came from. Whereas now, as Andre said, you they're, they're now that they 205 Live is a, like a main roster show, 
it just feels like the same style of Raw, a Raw or SmackDown, and those guys can do so many different things besides that style. And you know, as Andre said again, like we get that from Raw and SmackDown every week. Let let two hundred five live be the cruiserweights being cruiserweights, just like how they were in the in the tournament. It's I, I don't. It's just it's, if it feels like if they could find the balance between having them do the WWE style and also it being more of an independent high flying show, there would be, it it would be more of a happy medium, but it's, it just feels like they're, they're being forced into WWE style of doing things. And that's not necessarily what they should be doing. I understand safety and wanting to avoid injury, but the cruiserweights, there's a certain style and nitro back in the day when you saw those cruiserweight matches, you expected a certain kind of style, and that's what I want to see today. That's what I missed today in, in, on the 205 Live brand. Well, they didn't hold back, and no, it's not the, you know, a football player is in control, or he, you can get a concussion and still want to go back out there and not let you, them, them not let you, but if a guy wants to do, you know, put himself at risk in, in other ways, like doing flips or making a match more exciting without head trauma, then I don't, I don't, I don't understand why you don't just give him the keys to, to do so. Um, but a- another issue with the cruiserweight division is, and or 205 Live really is that most of the exciting stuff that happens in the cruiserweight division actually happens on Raw and not 205 Live. And it's still fun story stuff. The Zo Train is funny and entertaining. It doesn't really show off a lot of the guys' great wrestling ability, which was supposed to be the point of the thing. And that maybe it got to WWE instead of being talented wrestlers putting on Mac Classics. So. Uh, but at the same time, I do enjoy the Drew Gulak stuff, and and Enzo has done a great job for the two. Of, just think if they didn't have him after Neville and Aries, what would we would be saying now? We'd be, probably be just trashing uh, two hundred five live in an unbelievable manner. I would I would expect. Uh, but let's talk about Raw a little bit. Um, you had Raw general manager announce that the first ever Women's Royal Rumble will have the same rules and the same amount of competitors. I think this is the right move, and with we kind of added up the divisions and put about close to 20 girls in there. We could have a lot of surprises, maybe girls from the May Young Classic or some, some bring back some. Back. Yeah, I think that's imminent. I think the total was between Raw and SmackDown eligible women for the Rumble was 19. I think it was. I think we had 19. So yeah. we get 11 combination of NXT women surprise entrance and like one-time appearances i'm looking forward to this this is gonna be fun man this is probably what i'm most looking forward to until we find out what they're doing with broken excuse me woken matt for royal rumble the most i'm looking forward to is the women's rumble match and if they screw up the men's match at least we get a women's match that we can i don't think they're gonna screw this one up it's gonna be too good yeah i'm really really looking forward to this women's rumble match history being made and the the fact that there is so much space for surprise entrance or just people that we don't know who it's going to be because like you said we we can nail down the women that are on raw and smackdown and obviously they're all going to be in it because they need to fill the space but just the the fact that there's so much space for what you say 11 slots that's that's a lot of people that's that's a lot to work with there's going to be a whole lot going on that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, and it's going to be really exciting to watch. And it could be more like seventeen because each champion could potentially have a match for Raw and SmackDown, which would take away two competitors potentially. I heard that they're not planning on having the two women champions have matches at Rumble, so as not to take two opponents away. What I heard, I don't know if it was Meltzer or someone else, might have been Cage Side Seats. They said that they think. They're going to have the two women either a commentary or a ringside for the match at the Rumble and just not have them wrestle because, the, like you said, there's two opponents that you're taking out of the That must be so, so bittersweet for Alexa and Charlotte right now. You're the like, champ. Yes, you're, 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 at the top, you're, at, you're at the top of the mountain, but you're missing out on the first Women's Royal Rumble match. I want, I want, I want a cash in to happen before the Rumble so we can see Charlotte in the Rumble because she's – too good of an athlete, too good of a talent to not be in the first women's rumble. I understand she's so good that she's a champ, but oh, I wish she was in the rumble. That's that's I, my I one. That's my one minor, tiny, little itty bitty complaint about the women's rumble is that Charlotte's not going to be in it, or doesn't look like she's going to be in it. Yeah, only time will tell. Uh, another 
weird thing with the shield ending. There was uh, Rollins, uh, Rollins and Reigns in consecutive segments. No mention of the shield, just kind of the Dean injury. But then later they would do a, a locker room, uh, I don't know, conversation, I guess, where Jason Jordan would then come in. I like it. They're, it was so awkward and funny it and was. uncomfortable. He's doing a good job of yeah. playing that role. This is the first time I've actually believed in Jason Jordan as a character in any sort of way outside of him being a great in-ring competitor. Be, once he's outside the ropes, I, I don't really buy in. Last month or so, yes. I'm I'm in on his very his slow build heel turn. He's playing that white meat uh, Rocky Maya via bo- uh, baby face, and it's working really well. And you can there the seeds have been planted all over the place, and I really like the way this is going to bloom. So a big credit to Jason Jordan. I didn't I believe I thought they put him in a too big of a spot too early when things were seemingly fine with him and Gable as one of the best tag teams. Now things are really working out for both guys. It seemed that Gable was maybe getting the short end of the stick, and I don't think he's quite crawled up to you know the uh, the level that they they've seemed to be putting uh, Jason Jordan on on a singles level. But Chad Gable has the last couple of weeks getting uh, closer and closer to inching you know that gap to between the two. The last couple of weeks smacked on SmackDown. I would I would argue that the tag team matches have stolen the show and. Chad Gable is the one who shined the brightest. I would say Chad Gable has shined the brightest in the tag team division, and right underneath him has been Aiden English, which is just such a weird thing to say. But I 100% agree with you. Everything that they've done as of recent with Jason Jordan has worked. I think I can speak for all of us when I say I'm still not sold on the Kurt Angle, father-son angle. Still not sold on that. But now that that Jason Jordan and Seth Rollins have been paired together and Seth Rollins is kind of reluctantly coming around to Jason Jordan and kind of buying into him being a viable tag team partner and competitor. The way that they've been playing that out the past couple of weeks, fantastic. Agreed. I wasn't a fan of the the Jordan angle, son angle, but uh, with the way they're doing the slow burn build, if it all turned out to be I'm trying to think of what Eric Bischoff's not Eric. Yeah. Eric Bischoff said when they reformed the NWO, uh, but whatever it was a sham. If it was all a sham, it was all just a ploy to get to better his career. As I've said a few times, I'll be happy with it. Then I'm happy with the way they're booking Jordan. Now I didn't like it at first, but as Peroni said the past month or so with the slow build to the, what looks hopefully to be a heel turn. I, I, I really like what they're, what they're doing with, with Jordan right now. Oh, and you... Sp- Never mind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, they didn't mention the shield, but there was one mention of the shield by one Samoa Joe later on in the show, but I'm assuming we'll get to that. Oh, That's we're getting that to that right now. Has to be the promo or interview of the week, whatever you want to say, any type of uh, whatever way you want to peg a, a talking segment. Samoa Joe, backstage interview with Renee. Oh, my goodness. You guys want to take it from here? This, this had to be the best of the week, and it was... Uh, I don't think that Renee was ready for the words for to come out of Samoa Joe's mouth either. I'm going to start calling him Savage Joe because <laughs> it was brutal. So over the past couple of weeks, Renee has interviewed Samoa Joe backstage since he's injured Dean Ambrose. And you could just see the uneasy tension between the two. The interview starts off. You know, usually Renee Young, she'll, hey, please, you know, please welcome my guest at this time, so-and-so. She starts off, welcome my guest this time, Samoa Joe. Because she knew, she she, she might, like like Franny said, she might not have known the words that were that he was going to say, but she knew that it was not going to be good. At one point, Samoa Joe calls out Dean Ambrose for being injured and saying that he's a stay-at-home husband now collecting paychecks from his wife. And his wife is the person that's holding the microphone interviewing him. Uh, and she goes... Yeah. Okay. Turning her head yep. like, oh wow, yep. wasn't. <laughs> and I feel like, I feel like within the next few weeks they're gonna have Renee Young continue to interview Samoa Joe and continue this tension, and that'll that'll just be fuel to the fire for when Dean Ambrose comes back to have him and Joe be able to have a, a, a feud or a rivalry. So it was it was brutal, but it was awesome. It was great. I loved watching it when Samoa Joe said he turned uh, Dean Ambrose into a stay-at-home husband collecting paycheck from his wife the camera kind of panned out and you saw renee and i was just like oh this is awesome yes best promo of the night possibly of the week uh i missed a lot of smackdown most of it actually so i can't speak for that show but 
Oh, Samoa Joe. That was that was my favorite promo. I kind of upset that he didn't win the title from Roman Reigns, but I don't mind seeing Roman with the title. Hopefully they do a 180, which which you're not going to, and keep the title on Roman, but I don't see it happening. And then also besides him saying saying what he said about Renee and Dean, he, he it was just also one of the most passionate yeah uh uh, inter- backstage interviews that I've seen recently. He was he was just he also said that yeah Roman Reigns this might be your yard but you're living in my world like he just uh it was it was great it was it was such a good promo. Samoa Joe's awesome he's killing it. Yeah I'm actually I didn't like some of the psychology in the match with him I think he should have won but there was a time in the match now Roman loses if he's disqualified. Yep. I don't know if that necessarily includes a, a count out because Joe broke a ten count that he could have rolled in the ring uh, at ten and had uh, Roman Reigns lose and instead rolled back out of the ring. So I don't know if it was like DQ. It was only DQ. Okay. So if, so it, if, wasn't, if it would have got if okay, it would have been the count out, Joe would have won the match, but Reigns would have kept the title. Okay. So okay. All right. So I guess so that's that why does he make broke sense. Count, yeah. All right. All right. Yep. I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with that uh, explain, explanation. So, but Samoa Joe, man, he's. I mean, we all know he's really good on the mic, but he's still like underrated in a lot of ways. I think he's he's right up there with the absolute best. He has an amazing lexicon. He never falters. He's just continues to get better and better on the mic. And he's I mean, he's never been bad, but he just it shouldn't be surprised anymore. But I'm still he still uh, amazes me when he gets a chance with the mic in the, in his hands. So a lot of credit to him. How how do you guys put him without Cena being a regular right now? Where right now in WWE does Joe line up with on uh, in terms of on the mic? He's he's right up at the top of the heap in my opinion, especially after this promo. You put en- Enzo above him. Yeah, that's kind yeah, of Enzo's I, I, thing, Enzo, right? Enzo's kind of top dog on the microphone in the company at okay. the moment. Uh, New Day, Usos, they're up there. I know they're those are both group slash tag teams, but they're both. If we're talking mic work right now, they're both very high up on my list as well. But Joe's right up, right up there with. He's in the thick of things with all of them. I'll slide Joe in above Usos, below New Day for like the fourth spot, I suppose. Where do you have Kevin Owens on that list? Oh, Ke- yeah, gosh, he's got to be right up there too. Is he number two? Is is Enzo one? I KO two. I think so. Enzo one KO two. That's that's how I I view it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that and makes New the most Day. sense. New Day. I put Joe as four. Usos. I'm trying to. Th- I feel oh, like I feel like no, Usos are people. great. That we are certainly missing people, but um, I don't know. Matt Hardy's there now too. If I don't know oh, if you. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yes, <laughs> he's at the top of the list. No, oh, he's the man too. Oh, that's t- there's WWE is so talent, so much talent on the roster right now. It's un- unbelievable. Uh, before we get to our last thing, I want people to check out our social media pages we're gonna do our best to do the schmozzies next week our award show from 2017 so we'll if you have an idea for a category or a nomination or something you think that should be included uh, i want you to let us know about it yeah you can message us or post on our wall on facebook you can tweet us you can even you can even hit our dms on instagram find all of the find all three of those at the schmoz cast and last thing i want to get to is the possibility of the the Balor Club. I mean, there's a backstage segment. Finn says he's in the Rumble. All of a sudden, the club is behind him with Gal. Of course, Gallows and Anderson. Was this a one-off or is this a thing now? I'm really, really, really hoping that it's a thing now. Uh, reports that I've read over this week kind of hint towards it possibly being a thing. Um, also, I just watching the three of them in the ring two sweeting each other with the biggest smiles on all three of their faces it was it was just it was the reunion that took way too long to happen they they've all been on monday night wrong way longer than they should have been without this reunion so my hats off to to the powers that be for finally making this a thing and i mean all three of them gallows and anderson and finn balor they they're kind of in weird spots right now they could benefit from each other i really really hope that this wasn't just a one-off thing and that going forward the the i'm sure they'll be coined the balor club is a full-blown thing i don't think it's a one-off based on social media and stuff like that i think they're keeping this as a thing and i hope so because it's much needed for all three of them, but especially Gallows and Anderson. This could be the best thing to happen to them in WWE. They kind of went that way a little bit with AJ Styles before they broke them up. This could be great. This could be better because they're the original trio. OGBC. Yep, yep. Finn Balor talked 
within the last six to eight months or so, there was an interview, and he said that that would maybe be a step backwards for him. Yes, for him to help out two guys who are kind of swimming in a in a pool of you know by themselves and you know near the bottom of the card, really. This could be a huge deal for Gallows and Anderson, more so than Balor, but I actually think it's it's could be good for Balor, too. And I know he thought that it might be a step back just because it's something that he has already done and been a part of. I think this is a this is a right move to make. I think it makes Raw more interesting to have this faction back together. So uh, before we get out of here, Tweet of the Week, what do you got for us? I have one from Aiden English from a couple days ago. In all caps, he says, On this day in history, a couple lines underneath it, it was Rusev Day. <laughs> There you so have happy it. Happy Rusev Day to everybody. Happy Rusev Day, folks. That's right. So thanks for checking out the show. Check us out next week. And, of course, uh, if you go to SunPrairieMediaCenter.com, you can check out old old versions of the show and um, tune in that way, too, if you want to just stream the show. But catch us next week at our time, 11 a.m. right here on 103.5 The Sun, WLSPLP Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Thanks for listening. My name's Tom Stelauer, and you're probably... Nature Boy's not going to be happy about this. Speaking of Jay Lethal, he's interrupted Ric Flair and his fortune faction. to 103.5 FM, WLSP LP, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. <laughs>